So good afternoon, friends and colleagues, and thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the 2013-2014 lecture series, Technology and Governance, which is focused on how digital communications is transforming political and public life, and how governments are capitalizing on the latest communication technologies for internal operations and to engage more comprehensively with the public. With citizens becoming increasingly dig digitally savvy, governments are going to have to respond to the rea realities of mobility, virtualization, and social media in order to stay connected and relevant in citizens' lives. My name is Kathleen McNutt, and I'm the Associate Director of the Johnson Shama Graduate School of Public Policy, and I will be your moderator for today's event. As many as you know, we are one school with two campuses, so I would like to extend a warm welcome to our colleagues and guests at the University of Saskatchewan campus, where the event will be moderated by the school's Executive Director, Professor Michael Atkinson. Today we are extremely pleased to welcome Jeffrey Roy, who is Professor in the School of Public Administration, Faculty of Management at Dalhousie University, where he specializes in democratic governance, business and government relations, and digital government forms. In addition to teaching and researching, he has consulted at all levels of government, the private sector, the United Nations, and the OECD. I am personally a huge fan of Professor Roy and have been reading and using his scholarship throughout my academic career. His latest work titled From Machinery to Mobility, Democracy and Government, the Partic Participative Age, that was a hard thing to say, um, is, is a must read for those implementing public sector social media and mobile programming. And it's from this work that today's talk will be drawn. He is also the author of E-Government in Canada, Transformation for the Digital Age, which is considered by many to be one of the definitive works on the subject in Canada. In his spare time, he's associate editor for the International Journal of E-Government Research, a featured columnist and Canadian government executive, and has published numerous journal, journal articles on the subject. We are thrilled to have Professor Roy here today to talk about mach from machinery to mobility. And for the first time, the school is going to encourage you to use Twitter to, um, to interact with the guest speakers. So I think there's a, <clears throat> the hashtag is going to be FLS Roy, which should be on the boards in front of folks. And um, our handle is at, is at JSGSPP. So following the talk, we will entertain questions from the audience. But for now, join me in welcoming Professor Roy. Thank you, everybody. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here with you today. Um, I mentioned to uh, a colleague of mine not so long ago that I was coming here to visit your school and give this lecture. Uh, one of the first things that he said was, they have such a strong school there in Regina. I think it's something that I've heard uh, echoed in many parts of the country. And so it's a, it's a real privilege to be able to visit in person and uh, share a few remarks with you today. And then hopefully we'll have some questions both in person here and online as well. I'm also grateful to be here on a Wednesday. As I was saying to Kathy earlier, this is the uh, fourth consecutive Wednesday where we're having a snowstorm in Halifax today. Um, so it was great to travel here yesterday and, and be here safely in the context of... Uh, this lecture series. So kudos to those who planned uh, this event to, to be on a Wednesday here today. Um, as Kathy uh, mentioned, um, I uh, have been writing uh, columns for various publications on topics to do with e-government, digital governance. And uh, I've been doing this for a while. In fact, so long, so long, in fact, that when I thought about it, I started to feel a little bit old, but nonetheless. Um, I, just, I just wanted to start by um, reflecting on two columns that I've written. One is just going to be out now this month, um, and another one was out last year, to provide just a little bit of context around what I want to talk about today. So the, the first column um, that's going to be out now in Canadian Government Executive actually talks about Sochi and the Olympic Games, and I mentioned it because uh, I was able to draw from an event that I attended in November called the World Forum for Democracy, which was organized by the Council of Europe, which took place in Strasbourg in France. And um, there was a woman that spoke at, at, this, uh, at this event, a Russian activist by the name of Irina Yasina, who's very well known in, in Russia as a political organizer and an activist. And she observed in her remarks in one of the opening plenaries at this event that in her eyes, there were really two Russias, uh, not necessarily 50-50, but what she meant by that is, is that she felt that there was one Russia comprising primarily younger people, um, very engaged and mobilized online, uh, very interested in what's happening in their country, and in many ways very dissatisfied with the level of democratic governance in the, in the country. Um, and on the other hand, she said there was another Russia who tended to be a little bit older, or a lot older, depending on as the case may be, and very much focused on television. 
in terms of their uh, channel for seeking information and for understanding what's going on in Russia and for their kind of interactions with the state, uh, primarily through uh, state television apparatus. And that comment resonated with me because um, I think that that sort of divide is, is something that, that is something the government struggle with in a lot of countries. The notion that different people from different, different demographics um, uh, tend to interact and participate in democratic societies in different ways. And at this event, I also met a number. I also met a number of um, delegates from the Ukraine, youth delegates that were at this event as well. And uh, as you know, there's a lot of unrest right now in terms of protests and that sort of thing. And these young people were very engaged and, and very much um, involved in protests and online movements and using social networking to exchange information. And, and, and we've seen the result of that. I mean, not unlike what happened in Egypt a couple of years ago, uh, basically now the government has started to, to take significant steps, not necessarily reforms, but steps to kind of respond to this, this, um, this sort of democratic upheaval. Um, and yet at the same time, what we've seen in all of these countries that I've mentioned, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, or, or certainly Egypt in recent times, is that governments in place have, have often tried to, uh, to, to pull back and centralize information and become much more uh, top-down in terms of how they organize and, and share information. Recently, the prime minister of Turkey uh, called Twitter a menace, for example, to society. Um, and certainly in, in Russia and the Ukraine, we've seen state um, agencies, you know, struggling to respond to the online dynamics of what's going on in terms of organizers. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting um, reflection in terms of what this activist had to say about Russia and protests that are ongoing right now about certain issues to do with the Olympics and um, how this divide certainly exists in many countries today. Um, the other column that I just wanted to mention is also, I think, in some of the things I hope to explore a little bit in the next half an hour or so, um, is a column that was the most widely read column that I've ever written in publication. And sadly, that's only because of the title, and it really wasn't even my title. So I have to you know, be sort of humble when I explain why this was so wide, widely read, and it was because uh, of the title, I think, anyways, which was uh, Social Media and Gov 1.5. And I borrowed the phrase 1.5 from a, a, a Danish... Uh, Sorry, um, yeah, a Danish colleague of mine uh, by the name of uh, Journey, Jeremy Millard, who has done a lot of uh, research and writing in the realm of, of e government as well. I've worked with him um, in the context of uh, the UN process, and he's uh, a very influential person in the European uh, discussion around e government and social media. And as you um, may or may not be familiar with, uh, there are quite a number of references today this, to this notion of Gov 2.0 how governments, and I'll explain you know, what I mean by Gov 2.0 in just a minute, um, but basically it's this idea of government sort of responding to this online transformation, particularly the idea of a more participative web, which again I'll speak to a little bit more later on. And then we also have in place traditional governments in terms of how democracies function, how bureaucracies function, the interaction between elected officials and, and public servants, and um, there's often a disconnect between the two. And so what I said in this column um, is, is that I think that we're basically at a place now that we can talk about as being sort of Gov 1.5. There's a lot of experimentation with these new tools. There's a lot of interest in terms of trying to alter uh, government and, and become much more um, outward, much more participative, much more 2.0 in many respects. But there's also an inertia in terms of particularly the Westminster democratic model federally and provincially in terms of how governments tend to operate on an ethos of information secrecy, centralized decision making, um, and sort of command and control attitude to uh, managing information in particular. And so between those two tension points, I think we have something that we can sort of refer to as, as Gov 1.5. What I'd like to talk about today primarily is how the public sector is responding to this um, context that we might refer to as Gov 1.5 and some of the challenges that we see uh, for public servants. I think there is a political dimension to this as well, and I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit later on, because certainly public servants um, are very um, dependent on political leadership in many respects, and so the interaction is important there. But I want to explore some of the restructuring and some of the challenges that we see that, that public servants are dealing with in the context of, of, of really 
the struggle between new world and an old world. And what I often tell public servants in training seminars or um, classes of one sort or another is that I really think that for the next you know, number of years, perhaps even for much of your careers, we're going to be engaged in the struggle between old and new, trying to navigate this landscape of what we might refer to as, as, as Cup 1.5. And so hopefully that will become clear over the course of, of my talk over the next few minutes. And I'll try to illuminate that with a little bit of theory in terms of some of the uh, conceptual perspectives that I found helpful in, in writing my book, but also um, some practical examples of things that, um, that we see now in Canada that I think reflect some of the logic that I'm talking about. So as Kathy uh, kindly alluded to, um, the book that I recently wrote was entitled uh, Machinery Versus Mobility. And that was sort of meant to encapsulate what I just talked about, this idea of uh, tension between, on the one hand, traditional government, which we often refer to as a machinery of government in terms of the bureaucratic lexicon, um, top-down decision-making, um, hierarchical organizations, bureaucratic specialization, etc., and the notion of, of mobility, not necessarily in terms of just mobile devices, but mobile as um, basically a proxy for how the internet is evolving for a much more participative and, and open society. And just to give you an example of that, there's a strategy that's been developed by the state of Victoria in uh, Australia. And they actually have an explicit Gov 2.0 strategy that they published and committed to. And there are four principles that underpin this, this, uh, this Gov 2.0 strategy. Um, leadership, participation, transparency, and performance. And I won't talk about all of them, but I'll just sort of highlight, I think, participation as kind of the essential principle that really distinguishes um, Gov 2.0 from Gov 1.0, or really, if you want to use the more technical jargon, which is where Gov 2.0 comes from, this idea of Web 2.0 versus Web 1.0, and as perhaps many of you no doubt know, the idea of, of, of the traditional internet or the first generation of the internet was that um, we were largely recipients of the information online. Organizations provided information on websites uh, and, and channeled information to us as consumers or as, as, um, as interested uh, observers and that sort of thing. But through the emergence of, of Web 2.0, uh, social media platforms in particular, users of the internet had actually generate content, whether that's videos on YouTube or postings on Facebook or increasingly now Twitter. All of us are contributing in one form or another content to the internet and that creates a much more participative society. And through this platform, this Gov 2.0 strategy, the um, state of Victoria has, has launched a number of reforms to try and make government more participative in that regard and try and move in a more 2.0 direction. Um, in the 2013 Mannion Lecture Series to Public Service Leaders in Canada, which I believe took place in November, uh, the rise of the mobile internet was highlighted as the most disruptive technological force between now and 2025 by a gentleman by the name of Dominic Barton, who's the global managing director of McKinsey and & Company and a member of the Prime Minister's Advisory Committee on the Public Service. Gardner Consulting talks about four main drivers of the digital and mobile transformation that we see before us, social, uh, mobile, cloud, and information. And so, all of this to say that, that I certainly think that we're seeing a lot of um, evidence and a lot of important drivers in terms of how governments uh, need to be moving in a more 2.0 in a more 2.0 direction. So, what does all this mean for the public service? Well, in my book and in other writings, um, sort of drawn from the book, I talk about uh, sort of three schools of thought in terms of trying to understand the role uh, of, of public servants within a democratic governance context. Uh, the first is a traditional public admin um, approach. The second is uh, new public management. And the third is um, something called public value management, which other people refer to as the new public governance or new democratic governance, but um, I refer to it as uh, public value management in part because I reference quite a bit the work of a, a UK academic by the name of Jerry Stoker. He's written a fair bit on, on PVM. Let me just sort of go through each of these quickly and give you a bit of an example and a bit of some evidence in terms of how all three of these schools of thought remain highly relevant in today's public service that's becoming increasingly digital. Because one point that I, I want to sort of underline is that I'm not suggesting to you that 
one of these sort of theories is correct and the other two are no longer correct. In fact, what we have is a world where all three have resonance, and that creates um, some opportunities, but it also creates some challenges and potential ones. So in terms of traditional public and men, um, the, the logic of, of the internet and online communications is primarily one of communications as opposed to engagement. Uh, there's more direction uh, for public servants in terms of what to do with social media, but there are also more constraints in terms of how public servants should in fact use social media. Some of you might have seen an article in the Global Mail this week on the number of weeks that it, t that it takes, excuse me, getting my T's mixed up already, for federal public servants to actually develop, write, and get approval to post a tweet on Twitter as a good example of sort of the, you know, the logic of this, of this traditional mindset. Um, by the way, very analogous to that article is the work of a, of a Canadian uh, doctoral student, Amanda Clark, um, who also teaches at Carleton. And uh, she's doing her PhD in this realm as well. And she's written on this topic, if you're interested in, in sort of following up more on how the Canadian public sector is struggling with social media. Amanda's work is, is highly insightful in this regard. Um, we've seen also federally um, scientists uh, for the first time working within the federal public service basically um, prevented from speaking freely to the media online or in any other channels largely because information is increasingly being um, centralized in a, in a fairly uh, command and control and communications uh, mindset. Um, and we see this as well through the nexus of mobile devices and television. Um, the other day I was at an event where the former finance minister of uh, the province of Nova Scotia said something that I probably wouldn't be quite all that comfortable saying in public, but since he said it now that I, I, can, I can now say it, because he's a former elected official, he basically said that you know, one of the unfortunate things that he finds about politics today is that when you turn on your television and you watch elected officials, um, they never have anything interesting to say, so immediately he turns the channel. And he was making the point that's the case because although you get the odd exception here and there, um, particularly senior cabinet ministers or outspoken uh, members of the legislature that have sort of given up on their future careers and not, not, nothing to lose. Um, most elected officials are highly scripted. You know, they're there with their iPhone or their Blackberry and they're reading their talking points that they're given by the prime minister's office or the premier's office. And that's extremely unfortunate, but it kind of reflects this notion that there's a lot in our traditional Westminster mindset and model that is about uh, controlling information from the center. And of course, a lot has been written in the public administration community in this country about the centralization of power, the concentration of power in the prime minister's office, the central agencies in particular. And so this creates a lot of constraints in terms of um, the inability for public servants and elected officials in some cases to have uh, you know, freedom to engage in this online world more openly. Um, one final example, very quickly, uh, a woman, um, recently completed her thesis at Ryerson University. Her name is Anne Vermont. If you're ever interested in reading the thesis, it is online. It's quite easy to find. She's also a public servant working in the Ontario Public Service, and she did a survey, a fairly broad survey, of senior managers in the OPS. And she found that, by and large, senior managers are using um, online tools and technologies, such as email, um, social media channels, to the extent that the provinces allow them, et cetera, in a largely what she calls 1.0 mindset which is top-down, uh, providing direction, providing communication, far less in terms of engagement and openness. And her thesis is a very insightful sort of read in terms of the limitations of, of traditional public and men in a 2.0 context and how the traditional government model often imposes itself in a much more control-minded fashion. Um, the second school of thought that I mentioned is new public management. And as many of you are aware from your studies or from perhaps just hearing it referenced in the media, the idea of new public management is that um, we try and incorporate business style practices and, and industry uh, models of management, particularly those that emphasize performance, uh, into the public sector context. And so customer service and, and efficiency become very important values in the context of service delivery, for example. So we see federally the creation of Service Canada. Um, we see a lot of service type organizations in different provinces, um, 311 call centers by cities. And the idea is that governments try and focus more on uh, the public as customers and clients of public services 
And uh, there's, in this world, there's, there's some administrative empowerment to try to create uh, frontline organizations and individual capacities that can respond to, uh, to, to complicated um, customer service requests. But there's also some tension between traditional public men and new public management. I'll give you an example of that. Right now, if you look at the government of Canada, um, there is the example of Service Canada, but there's also the example of something called Shared Services Canada, which is trying to consolidate a lot of the back-end IT infrastructure for the government of Canada and begin to explore issues around uh, cloud computing solutions for things like email service services and database centers. And so, in essence, the point that I'm trying to make here is that although we've had um, a fairly... Uh, broad range of, of steps taken in the direction of new public management to try to create more um, autonomous service entities. Uh, perhaps the most significant example of that would be the Canada Revenue Agency, which a number of years ago was transformed from being a traditional line department to being a standalone agency to bring some of that operational autonomy to its operations. We can also see tensions between traditional public and men, and the idea of, of kind of more centralized systemic control and new public management as technology also becomes centralizing once again. And so I think in the context of, of Ottawa right now, uh, and the government of Canada, for example, the tension between Service Canada and Shared Service Canada is a good illustration of this tension between traditional public and men and, and new public management. And finally, there's public value management, which, as I mentioned um, is owed to uh, a number of different scholars and, and uh, currents of thought, but one in particular that, that I personally reference, and that is Jerry Stoker in the UK, and he has other references in his own work. But I think he has sort of provided an article that um, nicely sort of summarizes the differences uh, of these three schools in terms of the implications for managers and the implications for democratic accountability. What he says is that basically the idea of public value management is... Um, that you focus less on hierarchies and markets and more on the idea of networks and collaboration. And in fact, I'll just give you a, a little bit more of a definition around EVM drawing from Stoker's work. And basically what he says is public value management paradigm presents the achievement of public value as its core objective. The achievement of public value in turn depends on actions chosen in a reflexive manner from a range of intervention options that rely extensively on building and maintaining networks of provision. Networks of deliberation and delivery are central features of this governance approach. So once again, if the hierarchy is the kind of the traditional organizing prism of traditional public and men, and if markets are often embraced as the key prism for new public management, it's networks and uh, collaboration and deliberation that are keys to public value management. And you can understand how that would be a very... Um, comfortable alignment with this idea of Gov 2.0 and the four principles of the Gov 2.0 action plan from Victoria, Australia that I mentioned earlier on. Singapore, for example, the government of Singapore um, embraces public value management today and they speak of the co-creation of public value through collaboration and connectedness. So this is not an academic debate only and I was struck in recent days when I was thinking about giving this lecture uh, we've seen a very um, vivid illustration of, of these three schools and um, arguably the failure of, of a government to uh, embrace the third, and that is what's been happening in recent days. To pick on, once again, the government of Canada, um, the problems with the closures of Veterans Affairs offices around the country. And the fact that although there's probably a reasonable logic for these offices closing through the prisms of traditional public and new public management in the sense that a lot of these services are being transferred over to Service Canada. Not that these veterans will not have any frontline capacity. It's just that a lot of these offices were in remote communities, and frankly, they weren't being used by more than two or three people a week. So they're kind of hard to justify to stay open. What the government really failed to do was develop a plan to engage this critically important stakeholder base that people have enormous respect for. Uh, and find a way to kind of engage them in a process of transiting to a new service model that would make some sense. And I think it's, it's truly unfortunate in the way that the decision has been rolled out. Um, and it's obviously created some problems and some discomfort for the government of Canada. Now, contrast this approach with what Service BC did in the fall in terms of launching a public consultation 
with uh, residents and citizens of BC on the future of service delivery. And so this, I think, is a very good illustration of, of what PVM would look like in terms, of, in terms of practice, because what the government of BC did was they launched a public consultation to basically say, bear with me for one second, we want British Columbians to assist us in understanding how to build confidence in the approach to digital services and identity management. We must learn about the needs and values of British Columbians so that the province can meet those needs and values. And then they go on, I won't read you too much more, but they go on to say a strong public learning program is necessary for the success of this project. Without balanced information about the risks and opportunities in pursuing digital services, public stakeholders and experts cannot engage effectively. This project will maximize transparency about the province's plans so that it can invite scrutiny. And such scrutiny is critical for building trust, a significant desired outcome from this process. So to me, what Service BC is doing is a tremendously enlightened example of trying to embrace public value management and involve the public not as consumers, not as recipients of services determined by government and, and delivered in a manner um, largely orchestrated by government, but trying to do what Singapore government, what I referred to earlier, as sort of the co-creation of public value through a dialogue-based approach. And I think that that's um, encouraging and enlightening in terms of where we're headed. So what does all this mean as these three worlds kind of combine and create some, uh, some tensions for public servants and public service organizations. This is a good place to have a specific water system. It seems to me that the challenge here is to create workable and effective hybrids from all three of these schools, but instead we have major tensions between them. Public servants in turn suffer from a vortex of contradictory demands and expectations, and we have growing signs of information overload and stress. So the impacts of IT and now mobility are certainly becoming more prominent, but we need to rethink a lot of dimensions about the workplace and cognition and accountability in place in terms of trying to adopt the public sector to ways that can create workable hybrids between these three worlds. And I'll just sort of take a little step back to talk about my own teachings with public servants, both aspiring public servants in our on-campus program and uh, mid-career public servants that take our, um, our online blended learning program that are often working in the public sector today. And one of the things that I find very interesting is that when we do, um, when we do some, some survey tools to sort of question, probe people's comfort level with technology and, and tools today, um, there's a real significant demographic um, cleavage between the largely younger crowd on campus and the people that are mid-career working in government. Generally what I find is that the mid-career folks are much more likely to be suffering from information overload and difficulties in terms of managing the new demands on their time from mobility, from mobile devices, from email, um, whereas obviously the folks on campus are, tend to be more full-time students and so they're using these technologies much more seamlessly in terms of, in terms of their their communications with our students on campus, their involvement in courses that can be partly virtual, partly in the classroom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it just seems to me that we have this growing uh, challenge within the public servants of people that are struggling to kind of find a, a, a balance. And I, I, again, try and suggest this balance stems from um, the kind of clash of these three worlds and, and models that I spoke to earlier on. Um, McKinsey, um, which is a large global consulting company, uh, recently published an article on advice to public sector executives for information overload, so how to deal with information overload type issues. Some of you might be familiar with the work of Nicholas Carr, um, who's written a fair bit on the impacts of the internet on the brain and some of the challenges that individuals have in terms of the multitasking demands that a lot of us are actually required to keep up with today. I read a survey the other day that suggested that in the UK, um, people on average are checking their smartphones approximately up to 150 times a day. Now, I thought that number certainly must be exaggerated and couldn't be correct until the other day I went to a conference that our students had organized and I was sort of watching and observing people in the crowd, particularly the students and younger people. And 
it's true that people check their phones an awful lot. So I don't know how many times you've checked the phone so far since I've started chatting, but it's true that more and more of us are, are checking our mobile devices um, more often. Um, if you look at what's happening in the private sector, um, there's also some you know, disagreement about uh, the appropriate uh, uh, manner in which these, these issues should be balanced. For example, recently, um, there was something of a disagreement, although I don't want to frame it in that manner because the two companies weren't speaking back and forth. But if you look at uh, Yahoo on the one hand uh, and Marissa Meyer, who's a high-profile CEO of that company, and Facebook on, on the other, um, their chief organizing officer, chief operating officer, Shel Sandberg, um, recently published a book uh, called Leaning In, which was largely about gender and uh, the challenges of, of, that women face in the workplace. But one of the themes that she talks about in that book is the embracement of, of flexible work models and, and virtual work practices in Facebook that they feel is one dimension of an important uh, sort of approach to gender equity in the workplace and one one set of tools that they use to try and empower uh, women to, to balance um, home life and work life. And of course, not just women, but more and more um, men that are taking advantage of some of those opportunities as well. Conversely, uh, Marissa Meyer, shortly after taking over Yahoo, basically um, announced to the company that teleworking would no longer be permitted in uh, the company because she felt that for Yahoo to be an innovative company and to succeed going forward, and obviously they face their own challenges, People should be working you know, in person uh, within the confines of a single workspace uh, rather than um, being scattered all about you know, at home and, and what have you. And in an article in Wired magazine, um, a gentleman um, by the name of uh, Clive Thompson, who writes a fair bit around these issues, sort of tried to strike some middle ground between these, these two um, approaches where he framed it in this manner. And I'm not suggesting that Clive Thompson is necessarily correct, but I think that he puts his finger on the idea of, of differentiating the workforce and the workplace in ways that allow people to respond to these challenges in different ways. So what Clive Thompson says is the problem is both sides are right. Telework makes you more productive, and working together makes you more creative. And therein lies a paradox. The real challenge for people who run modern organizations is understanding what type of thinking they want to do, not where to do it. And where I'm going with this is that my basic premise here is that I think the public service, government on the whole, is far too dependent on traditional bureaucratic place-based work processes. And that in turn reinforces the traditional public domain model at the expense of some of the potential for public value management and Gov 2.0 to emerge. Um, you know, certainly in my own travels uh, in different parts of, of the world, I was recently in uh, Denmark, where a friend of mine who used to work in government, she now works for an environmental consultancy, and we toured her, her new building on the outskirts of Copenhagen, and it was it was unbelievable in terms of the facility that this that this company had created in terms of not only an environmentally friendly building, but also the tremendously um, differentiated and, and diverse set of workspaces that existed within this uh, building. So people wanted to to work in sort of their own cubicle type environment, they were able to do that, but they also were able to rent out private workspaces, work meetings, there were collaborative workstations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I similarly saw this in the Netherlands when I visited uh, government offices in The Hague where there was this sort of more flexible, collaborative mindset where people often worked at home one to two days a week and they used teleworking or telepresence as a way of, of maintaining a presence in the office. Versus my experience, although there are some exceptions as well, in my travels around federal and provincial buildings, certainly in the Halifax area, it's uh, starkly more traditional, to put it in a more polite manner that I can, in terms of the office facilities and the way work tends to be structured. And you know, it, I find that to be um, unfortunate from the perspective of our new recruits, who often spend two years in a graduate program um, personifying sort of new mobile workplace in terms of how they work online, in person, in class, outside of class. And then they accept a government job and they go to work and they're told, here's where you will sit, here's where you will work from nine to five, five days a week with few exceptions. Hope you're happy, go to it. It seems to me that that's a poor way of kind of taking advantage of, of the diversity that we're struggling to take advantage of today in, in, in this regard. And it's something I think governments have to do a lot better of. One other little tidbit, an example from um, BC, 
the government of BC recently did a survey of their own employees, and they found that less than one half of employees reported that they felt it was their office where they were most productive as an employee. So I think that probably a lot of us can relate to that. I know, you know, in my own life on, on, on campus at Dell, uh, I love our relatively new building, um, uh, but I tell people that you know, one of the reasons why you don't see me in the office every day, all day, is because there are three things that I do as an academic that are important. Um, I read, I write, and I teach, and I can't do any of those three in my office on campus. It's just, it's just not an environment that is, that is suitable to those activities for me, but it's an office that I can go and meet with colleagues, meet with students, uh, do other sorts of activities as well. But it's not an area that, that provides me with the focus that I need. But there are other colleagues in my school who have a very different view and who tend to work much more structured in terms of their, um, their lifestyle. And so I think that governments need to do a better job of, of being much more creative and, and diverse in terms of the sorts of workplace arrangements that they have. And the final observation I'd make on, on this note is that I think if you look currently at the U.S. federal government, you see the difference that uh, a political uh, leader engaged in these issues can make. So, um, you know, say what you want about uh, President Obama's um, infamous uh, health care website and what's happened there in the past few months. but. Certainly, if you look at uh, Mr. Obama and his decision to uh, use a BlackBerry, although I don't know what now whether it's an iPhone or, or an Android device, I don't know, um, and, and make teleworking a, a prominent priority uh, for the U.S. government, there's been a lot of interesting work done in the, in the past four years since he came to office in terms of exploring uh, and, and, and furthering telework across the U.S. federal service. And certainly, I get a lot of resources from um, federal organizations in the U.S. that actually talk about studies that have been done, experiments that have been growing um, in, over the past number of years, in part because of the digital impetus of the Obama administration and an Obama White House that is fairly well versed in, in digital issues. And so that really gets into um, one of the points that I want to make as I as I sort of talk about well, what do we have to what what can we do around these issues? How can we kind of break free from some of the constraints of the traditional world and, and embrace a much more 2.0 mindset. Cognizant of, however, the fact that the 1.0 uh, world it provides a foundation for public sector governance that we can't simply, simply discard, nor should we want to discard, because it served us very well. And there again, it sort of speaks to this need between balance and hybrids across uh, traditional public men, uh, new public management, and public value management. Um, so in going forward, I think we can look, we have to look to uh, public servants, we have to look to politicians, and we have to look to citizens um, to all provide leadership in different ways. I provided a number of examples where um, public servants are in fact taking the lead. When you look at the Gov 2.0 strategy of Victoria, Australia, that is primarily driven by the public service. Um, when you look at what Service BC is doing, that is primarily driven by the public service. Just give you a quote from the Deputy Minister for Open Government in BC, Kim Henderson, and some of the um, themes that I think speak to where we're going in terms of the future. She says, I think we breed public servants to be risk adverse, especially when it comes to outreach. Using different social media styles to communicate with citizens and being more open about information is not anything we've ever preached before. We've preached the opposite, which is more a culture of confidentiality where only officials can speak to media and only officials can speak publicly. We're turning that on its head. And so I think that we really are in a time where public servants um, have tremendous um, opportunities, but uh, it does require a uh, significant cultural change to how our public service organizations operate and also the interaction, of course, between public servants and, um, and elected officials. On that note, uh, with respect to elected officials, it certainly is incumbent on politicians to forge a new dialogue on new models of governance that are appropriate for this new age. Um, you know, when you look at the fact that it's the Victoria state in Australia um, launching this Gov 2.0 strategy, it's not that surprising when you consider that a decade ago it was that same state that was the first uh, state to have a formal legislative committee examine e-democracy opportunities uh, for um, Australians. Similarly, there's been already a formal federal Gov 2.0 task force under the previous government um, that looked at these Gov 2.0 issues from the national level. 
And moreover, when you look at the recent federal election in Australia that took place in this August, September 2013, um, all of the major parties published significant digital government platforms that talked about a lot of these issues that I'm talking about today. One of the things that I find a little bit discouraging about the current level of the political dialogue in Canada is that you know, the, the recent announcement by Justin Trudeau to, to change Senate liberals to liberals in the Senate, or whatever the case may be, somehow becomes a, a major significant um, step in institutional reform, whereas I think what we really lack in this country is a much higher level of political engagement around these issues in terms of thinking about democracy of the future. We are beginning to see this in this country, provincially and locally, um, particularly perhaps especially at the local level where there's a new generation of mayors that are becoming more well-versed in these issues. Um, I'm thinking of Mayor Nenshi, for example, who's been dubbed Canada's social media uh, mayor in Calgary, but also in, um, in, uh, in, in my hometown in Halifax, uh, Mayor Mike Savage, who was elected a year or so ago, was elected on um, a platform of open government and public engagements and bringing into HRM, Halifax Regional Municipality, a lot of these ideas that previously had simply been regarded as you know, sort of academic and not really of interest to the government of the day. So I think we are seeing the transformation. I think it's happening in a bottom-up manner, which I think is sort of consistent with traditionally how public and tends to evolve. But I think um, the more that we have a level of, of political engagement, not just in terms of ministers that are, that are driving these agendas, but also the legislatures and the parliamentary committees and the legislative committees thinking about these issues and engaging the public as well on these issues, uh, the better we will be served. And finally, I think the citizens, all of us, the public, we need to demand better. You know, there are lots of polls say people want to be engaged more. Um, and people are increasingly dissatisfied with traditional models of partisan representation, etc. So I, I think it's sort of incumbent on us to say, well, what do we want and how are we prepared to seek new models of public engagement and political activity? Um, I think there are lots of, again, promising examples of this across the country, things like change camps that are occurring, um, open data movements and, and apps competitions and, and different initiatives of one sort or another. But we also have a counterculture of consumerism and commercialization online um, which is appropriate to say on, on the day after Facebook's 10-year uh, anniversary because, of course, you know, Facebook is often regarded as a platform for democratic engagement, but let's be clear, their success is not about creating engagement for civic purposes. Their success is about commercializing the Internet and selling ads, something they're doing very, very well as of late. Um, Tina Nabachi in the U.S. Uh, at Syracuse talks about what she calls a citizenship in democratic deficit, which is something that... Um, that uh, we need to be thinking about collectively in terms of how our democracy is functioning. So in sum, what I think we need uh, are we need to forge more open and participative democrat democratic processes to in turn empower public servants with new capacities and tools to be more networked internally and more engaging externally while still preserving democratic accountability to elected officials. So this is why I think public value management um, although it shouldn't be seen as a dismissal of the other two schools of thought, which still remain very relevant in today's environment, is a useful prism through which to think about Gov 2.0 issues and through which to think about uh, networks and deliberation and the new and involving roles of, of public servants, uh, politicians, and public at large. With that, I'll uh, say thank you very much for listening to me today, and hopefully there will be some questions and dialogue for the next few minutes as we go forward.